that any of that is returning um, uh, certainly helps uh, Prime Minister al-Maliki's case. Now, that's Baghdad, Basra, central and southern Iraq. Uh, northern Iraq, the three Kurdish governorates didn't vote. Uh, Kirkuk, there were no elections in Kirkuk, which is contested between uh, Arab tribes and Kurdish tribes. And there's the ongoing debate within the Iraqi government over whether Kirkuk should become part of the basically autonomous Kurdish region. And at every chance the Iraqi government has had to legislate that, they've been unable to do so. Uh, in 2004, with the Governing Council, the issue was tabled. Uh, in the Constitution, in 2006, the issue was tabled. And again, the issue has been tabled. And you have um, increased threats of violence. You're still seeing sectarian violence, um, or rather ethnic violence, in Mosul, the second largest city in the country. There's still fighting going on there. Um, so even though there, there are some very positive aspects to, to what happened this weekend, um, there's a lot left unresolved. And overall, the power of the Kurds now? Um, I think it's been weakened. I think their position has been considerably weakened by um, al-Maliki's apparent popularity. And, and one thing, in addition to the status of forces agreement, Maliki has presented himself as, as a nationalist to some extent and, and is calling for a unified Iraq. And it certainly seems that um, calls for dividing the country into a loose federalist state, which, according to some observers, was entirely inevitable a couple years ago, and especially with the, uh, the gains made by the Supreme Council for the Islamic Revolution and the Kurdish parties in the 2005 elections, um, that seemed like a distinct possibility. Now it seems that, that forces that would keep Iraq intact uh, are growing in power. The reaction to the election of Barack Obama was very muted. Um, Sheikh Afan, actually, uh, who we followed around in Fallujah, um, <clears throat> sort of enjoys having his picture taken with American politicians, and he's, he's done very well for himself, becoming essentially uh, the U.S. point man in the city. Um, he had a picture with Barack Obama before the election, actually, and we said, well, what do you think of Obama? He said, foreign policy, American foreign policy, doesn't tend to change, regardless of the president. And I think... Um, most Iraqis feel that way. I, I didn't really talk to any Iraqis who seemed to think that, that there was going to be a significant change. I think Bush was already sort of forced into a position of negotiating this, this agreement that was not what the White House had set out to negotiate. And, and probably no matter who was elected, we'd be, we'd be moving toward a pullout. But still, I think it's important to say that we need to keep uh, pushing on this, too, because uh, uh, although the status enforcement agreement is in place, much of it hasn't been enacted up to the point that it's supposed to be at this point. The buka is supposed to be empty now by the, by the, in terms of the agreement. There's still, Explain what buka is. Buka is the, is the largest U.S. Uh, prison inside Iraq. Uh, it's supposed to be empty now, and everyone is supposed to be in the Iraqi system, but it still has around uh, eight, ten thousand 10,000 people in it still. Uh, the Iraqi government is supposed to be approving every single raid and action, that military action that the U.S. does now. That's not really the case. The military just picks up a couple Iraqi soldiers to ride around with them, and that passes for approval. And certainly the special forces raids that continue to go on don't have any approval pre by anyone that is <laughs> discernible. So uh, although, I, I mean, although it's promising what has been, what has been uh, agreed to on paper, um, there's going to be pressure back against Obama in the opposite direction. There's going to be military people who say we need to stay there and maintain stability. And so we need to, uh, people need to, both in Iraq and here, give some push back in the other direction to, uh, to help support him to make the decision that needs to be made, which is to continue with this. And the military contractors, uh, I mean, Barack Obama has not said he would ban them, although the Iraqi government said that they wouldn't give a new contract to Blackwater. Absolutely. That's, that's an, an incredibly key point. Yes, the Iraqi government is, take, is way ahead of Obama on this issue. They've uh, withdrawn uh, Blackwater's license to operate in the country, and they've removed uh, contractor immunity. So uh, even, if, uh, even if Obama wants to keep them in, I mean, you know, the, a government now that's uh, restrained, I mean, that has to appeal to uh, this popular nationalism that demands, you know, that uh, national sovereignty uh, and demands that these contractors be kept in check— uh, I mean, that, that needs to be supported by actions here in the U.S. What too. about Iran, Rick Rowley? Uh, this is the 30th anniversary of the uh, Iranian Revolution, 1979-2009. What about its power in Iraq? And that is, uh, well, 
Iraqis say, uh, I mean, or many, especially Sunnis, most of the Sunnis that we interview, the people in the Awakening, the people in the Islamic Party say that uh, there were two occupations of Iraq that happened at the same time, an Iranian and an American occupation. And it was true that, that ISKI, uh, the Islamist party that the U.S., uh, you know, in one way or another put in power in the country, uh, was formed in Iran. Uh, and the Badr Brigades, which formed the core of the security services in 1994, were trained by the Iranian Revolutionary Guards. So these parties, which were identified uh, clearly by Iraqis with both the American occupation and with Iranian foreign influence, they're, they're uh, seeing a loss in power now. Um, Iran is, is always going to be very, very powerful inside, I mean, inside Iraq. They're, they're neighbors. They're incredibly close and linked culturally, uh, religiously. Um, but, uh, but there has been a massive backlash in, or reaction in Iraq against what they see as foreign meddling, both from the United States and from Iran. You are both just back from Iraq. You are headed to Afghanistan, Rick, in the next few months. Uh, the level of violence we've seen both in Pakistan with these uh, attacks uh, with the U.S. behind them, the unmanned drones, and Afghanistan. Yeah, well, the, um, the thing that I think is, is important is... Uh, uh, that I mean, there's been lots of talk about taking the lessons from Iraq and, and, and you know and applying them to Afghanistan, uh, and there's huge problems with that, uh, especially because the lessons that people are getting from Iraq are, I think, the wrong lessons. People look at the surge or talk about surging into Afghanistan, copying the surge that worked in Iraq, uh, but it, you know, just a, a cursory examination of the facts shows that it, the surge didn't wasn't what changed uh, the course of the war in Iraq. It was uh, it was the awakening. It was uh, these tribes. Uh, in Anbar that began to see, well, that were scared by a sectarian war that happened and began to see the Americans as, uh, uh, as you know, less dangerous to them than the Iraqi government, which they saw as an instrument of Iran. So they were very specifically, by the sectarian violence, forced into an alliance with the Americans. That, that's not going to happen in Afghanistan. Well, that does it for our show, and I want to thank you both for being with us. David Enders and Rick Rowley uh, have been our guests. They are both just back from Iraq. And that does it for our broadcast. Democracy Now! is produced by um, Mike Burke, Shreve Abokadu, Sanjali Khamet, Hani Massoud, Robbie Karen, Nicole Salazar, Steve Martinez. Our website, democracynow.org. I'll be in Atlanta and Washington, D.C. this weekend. Check our website. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks for joining us.